I know what some of you might be thinking. There they go again, garnishing the conference with some Hispanic kid. <laughs> but not everything is as it seems, right, brothers? Because God's work is rarely skin deep, isn't it? Before I begin, I just want to acknowledge that this task is so impossible. Not only because I'm not the right man for it, not only because I'm the wrong skin color, not only because this is the last session, not only because God's glory goes to the ends of the earth, but because my poor old manuscript after five sessions had to be a little adjusted from all the other prophetic utterances from my brothers, and I'm so grateful. But last night was a late night, and I guess I have to be a little more jazz-sided these days. <laughs> but Brother Carl's book, and I want to say brother because that's the way we say it in Uzbekistan to one another. They, they take the text from Matthew 23 very seriously. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. And so we say, askaraka, odlaka, aka means older brother. And so both, it is a term of endearment and respect at the same time, acknowledging that Christ is our only teacher and our only master, and that we are just slaves. And so when I say Brother Carl, I mean with great affection for him because freedom at last has had a deep, deep, profound impact on me. He has helped me see the black experience through the, through the lens of sovereign grace, which is exactly what we need to do because it's not just for black Christianity, it is for the nations. And that's what I want to speak about this morning. And what I want to do, and what I wanted to do before, and now what I want to do even more is to enlarge that vision. Not that I can, because I'm not an African American, but I want to enlarge it to see the vision of the soul dynamic extended all the way to the nations, because it is breathtaking. It really is. It's a vision of the promised land that has not yet been fulfilled. It's God's vision for them and for us. And to that vision, I dedicate this message and to my dear wife, who God has blessed me with to carry this burden as one flesh. So let's pray together, brothers. Father, we come now as a people, and this has happened so many times we repent, Father, because our black brothers have come to this country not as immigrants, as Brother Carl said last night, but as slaves and in the name of Christianity and hindered from the gospel. What a terrible, horrible thing. Because the judgment on us that the, these things that we do to at what the world says is the least of these, my brothers, we do exactly unto you, Lord. And so what a horror it is. And of course it's going to take a long time for us to unravel it because the sin is so wicked. And Lord, at the same time, I acknowledge that if we repent and if repentance comes from my lips, then John the Baptist could get up right now and move me over and say, then bring forth the fruit fitting with repentance. And as our brother Sherard said yesterday, Lord, don't repent if you're not going to do anything. Don't remember if you're not going to keep it in your memory. And so, Father, we want you to do that now, Lord. Because as you said, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor nor uncircumcision means anything. But faith working through
true love, and we love our black brothers, Lord, and so we want to work, God. We want to work, not because we trust in ourselves, but we believe in faith that you're going to help us because this is so impossible. And we want to acknowledge the debt we owe to them, Lord, because Jonathan Edwards wrote, because our black brothers served him and many others. And so, Father, we owe a debt to you for granting that grace to us as a nation. And we have lots to go before we're going to catch up to that debt. And so now, Lord, I pray that we begin that this conference to reverse everything, Lord, that you have permitted for some glorious reason to happen by your providence. Let us be a blessing to them, Father. Help us now. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. We all feel the weight of these days, I'm sure. All the major religions are tottering, it seems, at the epicenter of world attention. What do I mean by that? I'm sure you've been following the historic shift of nearly 100 million Dalit, or lowest caste untouchables in India. Last week, in the January 29th Network News edition, K.P. Yohanan, the Indian director of Asian or Gospel for Asia, this is what he said. The November 4th Dalit rally that saw thousands renounce the Hindu religion may be the start of a huge problem facing the, um, the church. As more Indians turn to Christ, worldwide prayer is essential. We are looking on the face of possibly huge persecution and martyrdoms in the days to come. We need much prayer. Now, here's the question. Where did that cataclysmic shift come from? In Brother Carl's book, he wrote that some criticized Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. because he adopted a methodology he learned from Gandhi in order to combat oppression in this country. And some said, that is from a Hindu now. But listen to what Indian Christians say about Gandhi's success these are, these are national indigenous Christians talking about the success of Gandhi and other reformers in India. He says, in it, this is Vishal Mangal Wadi. He's very influential to me. He says, in a country such as India, every champion of the world or the downtrodden sees himself as a savior or a mini-messiah. Carey, you know who I'm talking about, of course, William Carey in contrast, did not see himself as a savior, for him salvation is God's work. This understanding that transforming mankind was the work of God sounds alien today, but for 150 years it remained carries a binding, abiding legacy to all the reformers of India, not only for the Christians, but also for his Indian successors. Thus, India's independence in 1947 was not only a victory for Mahatma Gandhi, and for the freedom fighters, but even more fundamentally, a triumph for Kerry's evangelical England. Now look at that. This is indigenous national Christians looking back and looking to their forefather, not as, as, as Gandhi or even an Indian, but as a poor cobbler that came to their country to give his life. And what I want to say, brothers, is that we're not talking about an evangelical England that and, and a, uh, looking back on time, we're not defining evangelicalism as we do in this country as a denomination. We're defining evangelicalism in England as the Evangelion. What sprung up from out of England is the same thing that catapulted people and brothers like Andrew Fuller, William Carey, and of course, William Wilberforce. They are debtors to the doctrines of grace, and that is the gospel that launched Kerry to India. Listen to George Smith. He's writing about Wil Wilberforce. I don't know if, John, if you came across this quote, I need to validate it. William Wilberforce considered the toleration of Christian missionaries in India to be one of, listen to this, this is a quote, the greatest of all causes. Now, you know how much he felt about abolition. But he put the Indian mission on par with that because what he saw was the same efforts to restrict Christianity towards African Americans 
as happening in India as well. And again, we're talking about oppression. Commercial interests in England preventing the gospel from going to the Indians. Now, why do I put Wilberforce and bring them together and carry? Because the same gospel that hammered at the laws of the slave trade until it collapsed under Wilf Wilberforce's watch produced a zeal in Kerry as well to reach the uttermost parts of India. So when we say cultural reformation, we also need to talk about cross-cultural proclamation because it springs, brothers, from the same fountain. The gospel. So now more than 200 years since Kerry arrived in India, today, this is the seed that we're talking about, the seed that has just a very, what seems like just a mustard seed, has an incredible effect. 44,000 Indian cross-cultural missionaries working in over 440 plus indigenous agencies. That's Operation World 2001. So what we're talking about now is that the gospel is, unbear is bearing unprecedented fruit now, cutting now the root of Hinduism's oppression among the Dalit. And now it's beginning to fall, brothers. You see that? One little gospel word, it seemed. One poor cobbler coming, non-seminary trained. <laughs> okay, we won't go into that yet. So the question, of course, is that we have now maybe one major world contender against Christ, and I think that's Islam. Now, it's true, of course, that in the last 15 years, more Muslims have come to faith than at any other time in history, but Islam is still the largest and fastest growing religion in the world today in sheer numerical terms. Now, we're not talking about conversion rates, but by birth rate. And so when Muhammad claimed to be the rightful heir of Abraham, he did so. Now, look how he did this. He did so by completely rewriting the Old and New Testament scriptural witness. That should say something to us, brothers. Where the word of God is not available, there is something that will, of course, take its place. And that's what Brother Carl said to us last night. Listen to Surah 19, 28 to 29. The Quran reads, At length she brought the babe to her people, carrying him in her arms. They said, O Mary, truly an amazing thing hast thou brought, O sister of Aaron. Did you get that? Mary, the mother of Jesus, the sister of Aaron. Who is this woman? Well, it's Miriam, he thought. Miriam of Moses is Miriam of Jesus. You see that? A, a 1,500 year difference. How did that happen? Because there's no word of God in Arabia at the time, at least enough to convince those who are following Muhammad that he's absolutely wrong. Now, I must read from the Quran in a pastor's conference because I have to quote primary sources these days because Islam is being changed into whatever people want it to be. And we have to say that this is an incredible disgrace against Christ. Now, I'm very merciful to Muslims, but they've been deceived, brothers. Muhammad is a usurper of the true Christian faith, a true antichrist. He's a replacement for Christ. And I don't know if he's the real antichrist, but he's definitely one of them. And a billion Muslims now believe that he is the final prophet. Do you see how devastating that is against our Christ? Well, if we can say maybe that Islam is Mohammedan Christianityism because it derives all of its strength from Christianity, then we have to ask the question, how does Islam have its strength today? If it's not by superior revelation, why does Islam attract so many, especially in America these days? Listen to Jens Christensen. He has a 1977 course called uh, the Practical Approach to Muslims. I, I'm so grateful for Brother Carl's ministry. It has to be practical. It can't be theoretical because there are pain issues involved. But listen to this. Muhammad laid down by 
precept and example of the new law, that there is no distinction of race and caste and color and position, language or privileges among the children of Adam. Muhammad made no distinction between himself and the poorest slave. It was a Negro who first was given the job of calling to prayers. Mankind is one great universal brotherhood with unbounded liberty of spirit as taught by the Prophet. So, one of the great appeals of Islam is its claim to a universality that includes a brotherhood that transcends race, which is, of course, what we claim, right? Or do we? For people who are a new people group, and that's not just our brothers here in America, I guess I can say in some respect, I am a new people group. You heard my lineages. There is an identity question, of course. And if someone has a solution to identity, then they're very attractive. Brother Carl stunned me when he quotes from Malcolm X after he visited Saudi Arabia. Listen to Malcolm. You, you have to hear this, brothers. You have to feel the pain of Muslims and those who are not believers. So I have to quote them verbatim. Never have I witnessed... Now, this is Malcolm X. He went to Saudi Arabia, he came back, and he was so... It, it was an incredible upheaval, it seems, in his whole inner being. Never have I witnessed such... This is from Brother Carl's book, Free at Last. Such sincere hospitality and the overwhelming spirit of true brotherhood as I practiced by people of all colors and races here in this ancient holy land for the past week I have been utterly speechless and spellbound by the graciousness I see displayed all around me by people of all colors. I could see from this that perhaps if white Americans could accept the oneness of God then perhaps too they could accept in reality the oneness of man and cease to measure and hinder and harm others in terms of their differences in color. Quote, differences, not real, I think he means. Never have I been so highly honored. Never have I been so made to feel more humble and unworthy. Who would believe the blessings that have been heaped upon an American Negro? Do you see that? That should have been us. <laughs> and we really blew it. So you see, our brothers, our dilemma is very, very difficult. In the 2001, again, Operation World, Patrick Johnstone pleads with us to pray for, quote, black Muslims whose numbers have grown rapidly to 2.2 million, most from a Christian background. A small but vocal minority belong to black nationalist groups and to the Nation of Islam organization. The majority are becoming increasingly orthodox in their Islamic faith, yet nearly all are true seekers, seekers after God. What are black Muslims looking for? They're looking for at least one thing. They're looking for recognition that they are fellow heirs of the grace of God, aren't they? Co-equals with us one true brotherhood, that we have a union in Christ that is so mystical, and we need to unfold that. But of course, I want to say that I feel very unfit for this role, because I don't deserve to be unfolding anything. Black theology must come from our brothers, and I can't say anything, maybe, unless someone helps me, and I need your help so much. But I am not black, I'm not white, I'm not Hispanic, I'm not Polish, I'm not German, I am something else. <laughs> Kathy would agree, I'm sure. In 1996, when my wife and I went to the streets of Uzbekistan to try to learn language, I ran into, we call him an oxical, he was a white beard. He was working on the side of the road and I wanted to practice my language, so immediately I jumped right in and, and he stopped me and he said, what nationality are you? And I said, well, I'm from America. America, you know, I tried to pronounce it so he knew where I was. Yeah, yeah, he said, what nationality are you? 
I said, well, my father's Mexican. You're Mexican. Well, you know, my father's mother came from Spain, and my mother is Polish and German. And he looked at me. He said, get out of here. I'm a nobody, you know. I am a part of the great American melting pot, whatever that is, maybe. Because if Brother Carl has spoken last night, then we need to move on from this point to something fresh. And I want to do that. I long to do it. Because if this soul dynamic is not just for the black community here in America, and not just for the white community, and not just for the Hispanic community, and not just for the Asian community, and not just for the melting pot, but if it's for the nations, then we got to go somewhere with this, right? Let's do it, brothers. I, I can't do it unless you help, though. But of course, we need to begin somewhere, and the best place to begin is God, right? I think we all believe that no one, or at least few other men in this generation, have more profoundly and pervasively enlarged our theocentric view of redemptive history than our brother John Piper. And through John, God has drawn us back to our historic roots in Reformed theology. I can even use that word because we haven't come up with one yet, maybe cat theology would be appropriate. Probably Jonathan Edwards wouldn't be so comfortable with cat theology. But he's reviving what is the legacy, the reality behind the words which Jonathan Edwards sought to plumb the depths of, even though he was a man and acknowledged that God was a mystery in the end. But he wanted to enlarge our view of history, of virtue, of culture. Let me just quote John in his extended preface, preface to Edwards' is the, the End for Which God Created the World. Brother John says, Edwards could not conceive of calling any, true, any act truly virtuous that did not have in it, in it a supreme regard to God. One of the great follies of modern evangelical public life is how much we are willing to say about public virtue without reference to God. Which is a thundering indictment to us, isn't it? And of course, immediately you think of Wilberforce, right? We heard that everything he did was rooted in his own understanding, not of Calvinism, but of the Bible, which is where we get it all. But I think what Brother John means is that in all of our efforts at racial harmonization, and I mean that musically, because the soul dynamic is musical in a sense, in a powerful sense. But if Brother John means anything, he means that I think the reference point should not only be for God, not, in other words, acknowledge that God somehow is involved in this and we need to get on with the business of racial harmonization, but to acknowledge that God has a plan for this. And he's executing it unflinchingly, unfailingly. And we better get on board. Otherwise, we're going to be out. And we are going to be one of those people groups that Brother Carl said had a purpose and their purpose ended. We don't want to be those. Well, let's begin with Edwards. If God's chief aim in creation is to glorify himself above all other things, we need to ask something more precise. And that is... What means, above all other means, does God choose to glorify himself in creation? In fact, we can say now, I think, it's okay to use logic. I'm going to use some. That the cost or the value of any object, the cost, the price of it, is tantamount to its value. Can I say it that way? And so the more costly an objective for God is, the more he values it above all other objectives that he's accomplishing in creation. Right? Can we say it that way? 
And if we don't value it with God, we're in big trouble. Turn to 1 Peter 1 with me, brothers. I want to take my cues from all of my brothers who preceded me that the word has to speak and not us. 1 Peter 1, 17 through 19. We, we need to be very afraid, the apostle says. 1 Peter 1, 17 through 19. Conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers. What does that say about ethnicity? Futile. But with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Why should we be afraid? Because this blood is so precious in the eyes of God that if you even besmirch one drop of it, you will be in deep trouble. And so right from the outset, brothers, we need to see that the centrality of the cross of Christ is what we gather around. It's that banner, not any other banner, by which God has declared. Because the cross not only is the only way which God appeases his white-hot vengeance against us for disregarding him at every single turn, not only in our own lives, but if we go all the way to the feudal lifestyle of our forefathers, it started way back there to Adam but also because it is sufficient, it's efficacious, it has power, it does something, it redeems. This blood is not just available for us, it actually accomplishes what God intended. And if it's that precious, and if God uses it for that aim to do something, then we don't need to go any farther to search for what means, what is the primary means by which God glorifies himself in the world. Because against all other competing aims, purposes, intentions in the world, this most precious blood stained on the cross like a sla slain lamb before us forever, probably. God wants to remind us the price that it took to redeem us. So let me just review where we've been. To understand how God might be using the soul dynamic in the world, not only for us, but for the nations, we must understand his global plan to reach uh, in creation. Number two, his singular plan in creating the world above all other things is to glorify himself. Two. Three, the chief means by which he glorifies himself is redeeming his elect, the church. Number four, we know this because the precious value, the worth of the God-stained bloody cross, attestifies or attests to that reality. But God is not done because it's too little the glory that he gets from just that. Our brother and apostle Peter and fellow under-shepherd goes on. Because God is not redeeming for himself one ethnicity. Israel is simply a type of what he's going to do when Christ comes. He is doing something absolutely stunning in the world, and we will praise him with ever-increasing velocity, as Edwards would say, for what he's done. And Brother Sherrard has really helped us because for God to get glory, it needs to be absolutely diverse, completely diverse, and representative of every part of his glorious creation. 1 Peter 1, 1 through 3. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Why should grace and peace be with us in the fullest measure? Because the whole omnipotence of the Trinity went to go and redeem us. Do you see that? God the Father, the Spirit, Jesus is unleashed on one intent 
to call for himself the elect from all the nations and pull them out. Why do we have to go any farther if we want to see God's intent? And so you see, brothers, God is not ethnocentric in redemption. Maybe we can say he is exo-ethnic. Brother Carl's helping me these days by always trying to push the limits of neologisms. <laughs> so, if God chooses out from the ethnon to create an another ethnos, then we need to understand it more clearly. Chapter 2, verse 9. The Apostle Peter understands God reenacting the Exodus event when he redeems us. 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Where did he get that from? Well, Brother Carl has helped us again. Through the prophet Isaiah, the apostle Peter, in the collegiality of the apostolic witness, probably the apostle Paul has helped him, because he didn't get it with Cornelius. You see, even apostles fall, right? So we need each other, don't we? He looks back to the Exodus, and our brother Carl has done that for us. I'm not going to have you turn there to save time. Exodus 19, 4 to 6. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. What I did. Ha. Don't get it in your head that you did anything. I did something to the Egyptians. Do you understand that yet? Ha. No, you don't. But I will show you and how I bore you on eagle's wings. I'm the eagle, get it? You were in bondage, and I picked you up, and I pulled you, and what did I do? I brought you to myself. You see the typology of that? Verse 5, and now, excuse me, don't, you don't have to turn there. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. Or maybe in the Hebrew you could say Michal could also mean from all the peoples. And maybe that's what Peter's thinking. I don't know. For the earth is mine. Get it? I could have picked anybody in the whole earth. I own that earth. And I decided to pick you. Like Brother Carl said last night, I've got to get this right. You are not chosen because you're a Jew. You are a Jew because you're chosen. I decided that you will be a Jew because I chose you. I resurrected you out of the dead and I brought you to myself. And he did that in verse 6 so that you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So Peter, in concert with Hosea, moves on from that in verse 10. 1 Peter 2.10. For once you were not a people. Understand that? You didn't even exist before as a people. And now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Think about that. We were not even a people before. But God has bought us with his precious blood. Again, I'm going to read where our brother Tom has led us to, I think God anointed him because so much of what he said in introducing some Oscar that came up here was resonating with Revelation 5.9. And they sang a new song, don't turn there, saying, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals for, here's the reason why you're so worthy, for you are slain and purchased for God with your blood, your blood, Jesus. See the cross again, brothers? From every tribe and tongue and people and nation, you have been made to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So, brothers, what we need to do in order to understand, and please, cut me slack, because I cannot speak for the black experience in America, but I think 
we need to move, move, is to see the experience not within its own experience and not within its own experience in America and not even for the nations, but we need to look at it globally within the dimensions which are infinite of the omnipotence of God and His glory and His commitment to seeing it valued for all the nations. God is ecclesiocentric in His means by which he glorifies himself. Let me review again. To understand the soul dynamic, we need to understand the global plan of creation. Number two, we need to understand that his singular plan in creating the world above all other things is to glorify himself for God. Number three, the chief means by which he glorifies himself is in redeeming the elect. The church, we know this because the precious value, the worth of the God-stained bloody cross testifies to that, but it's not glorious enough to take one ethnicity. God has to choose some from every tribe and tongue and nation and people to show not that they're valuable, but that He's omnipotent. And the efficacy of that blood can do it not just for one people, but for every last people. And so right now we're on our on the tips of our toes waiting. God, finish it. Your glory is not enough right now. You need some more people groups to fill up that glory. And the soul dynamic is the answer to that. Let's listen to Jonathan Edwards. If this is God's intent, then of course it should be ours as well. The scripture. Now, when I say God's intent, I mean that God's intent is that he wants to glorify himself by being ecclesiocentric making the church the means by which he gets the most glory in the world. And that should be our aim as well. This is Jonathan Edwards again in our brother John's annotated reprint of the end for which God created the world. The scripture represents it to be the spirit of all true saints to prefer the welfare of God's people to their chief joy. Chief joy. We'll talk about how chief that gets, John, maybe. This was the spirit of Moses and the prophets of old. The good of God's church was an end by which they regulated all their conduct. And so it was with the apostles. 2 Corinthians 4, 15. For all things are for your sakes, Paul says. 2 Timothy 2, 10. I endured, for, I endured all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And the scriptures represent it as though every Christian should in all he does be employed for the good of the church as each particular member is employed for the good of the body. Now how does that apply to racial harmonization? I think it applies this way. That if we are looking at racial reconciliation as some means by which God is glorified, we need to do it ecclesiocentrically. Begin with the church. Work through the church. See God's glory exalted in the church. Because the world is, is at least secondary to God for now. Well, I have not much time for questions if I keep going at this rate. So I want to be careful because you need to help me. I want to go on to if our purpose should be to align ourselves with God's ecclesiocentric aims in the world, then we need to do it in one particular way, I believe. 1 Peter 2.9 But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see that? It is declarative purpose that we have. And it is not a purpose as separate cultures, peoples declaring it in our own culture, but as a new people of God, together as one people, we speak with one voice. And proclaim his excellencies. We're not proclaiming our excellency. Why? Because you know what? We're not excellent. And God.
God gets the praise. Let me move. Because this is so essential. What is the content of our proclamation above all other things? Here it is in verse 9 again. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him. Now, there are many excellencies. But Peter has in mind one particular excellency. Who has called you out of darkness? We're not talking about skin color again. We're talking about blindness. You were wandering around saying, where is God? Here he is. Into his marvelous light. So some might say, the world. What kind of unity can a newly converted, Muslim backgrounded, Uzbek believer, and a third generation Swede, and a black African brother who's here in America, not of his own will, but because of a Christianityism that sought to gain from his coming, and an American mutt like me. What do we have all in common, brothers? This is what we have. We have God at our center, don't we? We are all free at last. All of our bondages to our Egypts, all of our stupidity, all of our wickedness were released. And not only that, we're resurrected as kings. <laughs> priests! We're not just kings, we're priests in the temple of God. What a glory! That's what we share in common, brothers, above all other things. Can there be a unity of us? Why? Because we're gazing at God forever. <laughs> The only sight maybe we're going to see in a billion eons is we'll hear the soul dynamic. I'm moving, I hope. I'm trying to define the culture of the people of God. First, I said that Islam is folding more and more people into its net, and black brothers are among those. Second, Islam claims a brother, better brotherhood than Christianity. Third, with Jonathan Edwards, we believe the chief aim of God is to glorify himself by redeeming his church. For, as Brother Sherard has said, the exodusing, the redeeming of a people for himself from the manifold manifest, increasingly, diversity of the nations, is what God is all about. Number five, when God calls out the nations from the nations, he creates a new people completely, resurrects them from the dead, eclipsing all their former futility. Six, as a new people, we must proclaim his excellencies to the unreached peoples of the earth because they need to be folded in too. They haven't tasted this God. And number seven, the preached message that unifies us above all other things is God and what he's done for wretches like me. Now, I'm going to go to some application, and I hope that you'll forgive me for speaking for anybody but myself. But I want to close in a way that directs us. There's one obstacle in my way right now, besides my sinus infection. <sighs> Brother Carl raises a very important problem in his book, Free at Last. Listen to him. There can be as many varieties of Christianity as there are cultures, but these cult cultural Christianities will not contradict one another. They will have a come complementary relationship as they focus on God's gracious deliverance accomplished in Christ. See that redemption there? Brother Carl has nailed it right on the head. It is redemption in Christ that we share. 
We focus on that. We identify with one another and say, yeah, that's what happened with us too. Hence, it is not necessarily wrong to have a white Christianity or a black Christianity. That's where I have a problem. And I need help understanding that, brother. Because if there is a white Christianity and a black Christianity, then the soul dynamic is over there and we get robbed. More than that, what do you do with the great American melting pot months? What kind of Christianity do you offer to them? My brother married an African American woman. She is a woman of God. And she has really helped us on our journey. So here it is. They have three beautiful little girls. These girls are Spanish, Mexican, Polish, German, and African American. We have the neo melting pot in America because that melting pot is moving, brothers. And now, what kind of Christianity do we offer them? And I want to say, does Revelation 5 allow for ethnic enclaves of worship? Tell me, where is that in the Bible? I want to find it in my Bible. You got one. All right. Okay. I thought we were going to have a problem. But I like when you raise your hand. Don't, don't stop raising your hand. Just, I know you're, you're looking to God, and I want us to do that. But if there is a black Christianity, and if there's a white Christianity, then something is really wrong, I think. Because isn't the dream that electrified the nation in front of the Lincoln Memorial on the 28th of August, 1963, in the year I was born? Didn't it say something like this? I have a dream that one day, he goes on, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I can't preach like him. He's a gift. I have a dream that one day every valley will be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places shall be made plain, and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. Brothers, in the church they have to see it first, right? The theological dynamic that pressed our brother Martin to this was he saw the vision that could have been in the church and wasn't. That the church inflicted all those things. And of course, he had to use prophetic language to not say it so strongly. But it's an indictment even after he's passed. Of all places in America, just listen to this quote. i got to read it the time. i got to be so conscious. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know that tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. Oh, he had a lot to be worried about, didn't he? I'm not fearing any man. Why? Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He could see it like Moses. He said, sorry, Moses, you're not going into the promised land, but let me give you a little preview. And it's coming. And Brother Martin saw it. And Brother Sherrard saw it, I think. 
Because the vision is from Ephesians again. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. One, 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 one. Let me go on to application, and I'll never get there if I keep doing this. No, I, I need you to preach. I'm going to propose something, and you can just tell me you're way off. But I have a burden, and I have got to share it tonight or this morning. It was tonight, last night. <laughs> Here it is. What if black led, black led, multiracial church planting teams preach the soul dynamic to the ends of the earth? The question, of course, is why not do it in the current churches? And the reason, like our brother, our Korean brother, I don't know where he is, said, our churches are not ready to be multiracial by and large. So the old wineskins won't work. We need new ones. We need new churches. And we need our black brothers to lead on in the soul dynamic. So here are the 10 reasons why I think it's so crucial that they do that. Number one, black-led multiracial church planting teams to the unreached would model racial harmonization to the nations. Why? Because Christ says, therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the Alter and re there remember that your brother, remember, like Brother Sherrard said, remember that your brother has something against you. Oh, yeah. My brother has something against me. So what can't I do if there is that something against me that's floating out in my brother's heart? What cannot I do? I can't worship, can I? So if I can't worship, how in the world can I speak the excellencies of God to the nations? It's impossible, isn't it? At least, I would be a hypocrite. And so what black-led church planting teams would do would model racial harmonization to the nations. And they would say, okay, sure there's a glass ceiling in American culture, but in the church, it doesn't exist. And sure in the culture, there is systematic structural racism but in the church, not where I'm at, it doesn't exist. In the culture, everybody wants to be the Lord with slaves around him. But in the church, the greatest among you will be the slave of all. And that's what we need to model. And someone of you might say... Look, it's not my fault. I didn't, I didn't do that. Don't, don't blame me. I have so many things I feel God's called me to do in this world. If I let this racial harmonization thing define my entire life, you know what's going to happen? I have institutions I feel God wants me to lead. I have research God wants me to do. I have a doctorate to get. I have books to write. I have churches I've got to plant. There are unreached peoples that need to have my name as the forefounder of all their Christianity so that I can go into the annals of all the history books as being the one who finally got the gospel in. And racial harmonization is really going to put a dent in that. What would you say to him? God's going to block me. Don't, you know, God doesn't want to block me. He wants me to be happy. You know, I'm a Christian hedonist. And of course, Brother John doesn't mean that at all. Otherwise, he wouldn't have this conference, right? But you could say, and I think I want to say, that if your whole life in the 1750s was going reasonably okay and you were in Africa and you had a vision for what you wanted God to do in your life and your children's lives and suddenly not any plan of yours 
God in providence put on you the destruction of your village, the kidnapping of your children and your wife, your precious wife, and you sat at the bottom of the backwash of vomit and urine, chained to some post, and then they dumped you. And as you drown, you say, God, I wasn't planning on this. Providence sometimes decides that we need to die. And this is a providential time in our history. Number two, black-led multiracial church planting teams would play the music of the unreached peoples. There are 1,600 so unreached peoples, and they're not unreached for no reason. They are unreached because there is usually governments that encase them with persecution, starvation, war, disease, famine, drought, linguistic separation, no access to any empowerment. No one cares uh, anything about them. They suffer. And so when we in the dominant culture come to them and say, I got some news for you. The gospel is really good news for you. They need to hear the soul dynamic. They need to hear, you know, I've suffered too, my people. And I have something that God can do for you. So the soul dynamic has resonance with the music of the unreached peoples. Number three, black-led church planting teams would keep the most important gift on apostolic church planting teams as the number one gift out in the forefront because cultural circumspection and Seeker-sensitive savvy and anthropological research is not what's needed on church planting teams. What is needed is something that wells up out of the depths of your soul. You need to say, I was blind and now I see. And we need our black brothers to say it. And we need them to teach us how to say it. That's what's needed on church planting teams, the soul dynamic. It's jazz. Because I can't tell an unreached people, let me explain to you how to be saved. They don't even have writing, some of them, yet. Number four, black-led church planting Multiracial church planting teams to the unreached would hinder us from exporting dominant culture, white Christianityism, to the unreached, which is really a problem for me too. I'm just going to go to five. Black multiracial church planting teams would challenge Islam's claim as the one true international faith. They're wrong. Do you know how they get international? They come into a culture and they impose a 7th century Arabic nostalgia. It's not even reality. And they say, this is the inspired culture that you must inherit in order to be a people of God. It's a lie. And black-led Multiracial church planting teams would say, I have some really good news for you about your culture. Number six. Black led multiracial church planting teams would create a multiracial Antiochian sending base. Because Brother Ellis wrote that the International Council, that, this is really, poo, hit me in Acts 13, that launched the first missionaries themselves were international from Africa. Didn't that stun you? You read that? Wow. I was like, well, we need to get back to the Bible. Because we need to be multiracial. Otherwise, we can't be ascending base, I believe. Acts 13. 
It would also enable us to be representatives of the churches that, out of which we come, to cooperate financially, to seek the pressing needs of those within our own individual local churches. This is really interesting. 2 Corinthians 8.24. Uh, Scott Pittman, a great brother of mine, helped me see this. Paul is talking about the collection that should come out of Macedonia and out of, um, out of Achaia. And he says to the Corinthians, he says, look, we have brothers from every one of the local churches. They're trustworthy. They are apostles of the churches. A glory to Christ. You see, apostles glorify Christ in their diversity by meeting pressing needs as well, I believe. Number seven. Not only a multiracial Antiochian multiracial sending base, but black-led multiracial church planting teams to the unreached would heal us of one of the all-time scourges of Reformed theology. Here it is. We don't do evangelism. That's God's job. We don't believe it, of course. But it still is a scourge on us. But the soul dynamic is not internal. It's not reflective only. It is spoken. It's oral. It's musical. It is preached. It's outward. And so the soul dynamic needs to inform our reformed theology, whatever you want to call it. Number eight, black-led multiracial church planting teams to the unreached would enable black theologians to be in the lead in an effort to repristinate. Oh, that was a good word that Brother Carl helped me see. Repristination. Wow, what is that? <laughs> you know, I didn't know you were here. I needed a my, my, my to help me. <laughs> repristinate the sovereignty of God for us and all the nations. Because when you say repristination, you mean we got to go back to the Bible, brothers. We can't go through any man, white, black, Hispanic, melted pot, whatever. It's got to be the Bible, the inspired Word of God. Number nine, black-led cross-cultural church planting teams would keep our mission the same as God's, ecclesiocentric. Now, listen to this. 1 Corinthians 10.31, you know it all. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Which means, of course, I think that in our lives we need to glorify God. And, and one of the really helpful illustrations was when Brother John said, take, for example, a glass of orange juice. You take your glass, and when you drink it, you know what you do? You taste it and say, oh, it's so sweet. It's so refreshing. It's, so, it's such a gift from God. And I have taste buds to taste it. And I see with my eyes, it's orange, bright color, and I like that. But I think, while it's true, it needs to go beyond that. I know Brother John wants to push it beyond that. Because some people have misinterpreted Christian hedonism to mean only that. Because the next verse, verse 32 says, Give no offense, offense, either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. So what Paul has done is link the glory of God with the offense to the church. So if the church is offended, guess what? God is not glorified. And so it's not just about drinking or eating pork or drinking orange juice. It's about God's offense in the church. And not only that, in verse 33, Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. You see, again, the glory of God is connected to the offense that we might commit against those because of our culture, because of the dominance that we have to the nations might affect the way we preach to them. And so I want to link it to God's ecclesiocentric purposes in the world. Apostolic black brothers from the church leading multiracial Teammates representing the church to give no offense to unreached Muslims or anyone else to plant among them the church to complete the diversity of the eschatological bride of Christ, which is the church. Church, church, church. Do you see that? Glorify God in the church. And here's the last one. 
black-led multiracial church planting teams to the unreached would help us understand that dying for the church is the highest calling of a human being. I need to be so careful here. Because what makes our ambitions percolate are often things that are not ecclesiocentric. It's about our own glory too often. So we need help. And I want to make this statement, and uh, unfortunately it's going to go on the tape, but it has to be. I don't believe PhDs most of the time plant churches. Because while PhDs can help us understand the mandate to plant the church, scholarship is essentially an internal activity. It is reflective, it's thoughtful, but the soul dynamic is jazz. It's outward, it's spoken, it's proclaimed, it's declared, it's church planting. The soul dynamic, and it's for the church, and our African-American brothers have it, and we can't lose it. Here's Paul. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church, Christ's body, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might carry fully the preaching, soul dynamic of the word. See, you suffer for the church. What comes out of you is that the church is so precious, it deserves to be suffered for. Do you know why, brothers, that the soul dynamic does not resonate with most of us? And I don't even know if it can be the theology of empowerment. Because I think the soul dynamic is a theology of suffering. And we just don't suffer enough. Because what captivated Jesus of all things, of all joys, and I'm not saying anything wrong about Wilberforce, it captivated him. But here's his joy. Isaiah 53, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper his hand. He will see it and be satisfied. Oh, it's such a pleasure, brothers. I want to lift up church planting and the suffering for the bride of Christ as the greatest thing that a human can do. And I don't say that lightly because I know my wife is right here and we are one flesh in this, and it's not easy. But it is what Christ did, and it's the one thing we were destined to do. So the soul dynamic is a stewardship from God, preaching Christ to the ends of the earth. Let us suffer together, brothers. Let us equip our black brothers to live out their manifest destiny with all due honor at the close of the age for the glory of God. I can't say it maybe any better than Carl has said it. A black man was the last to carry the cross, Matthew 27, uh, of Christ, Matthew 27, 32. Black Christians may be the last ones to carry the banner of worldwide cultural discipleship. <laughs>